Oh, uh, just hang on. <laughs> now, now you can start anytime. <laughs> Hi, everybody, and welcome to the ASP Net Monsters. This is episode number thirty-two, and in this episode, James is going to take us through caching things in memory, uh, which is something I could really use in real life as a memory cache. I think we all could. So maybe, unfortunately, these ones are not going to help out so much. Does uh, a does .NET Core not run on my brain? Not yet, but they're working oh. on a port. So I think that everywhere he does. But <laughs> okay, so we have. I think you have to wait for RC two for that, Simon. But okay, okay. well, six months from now. <laughs> or maybe six weeks or three. Who knows? Regardless, <laughs> to get caching going in memory, we're going to start with adding a couple of packages to our project. So this is... Now, I'm just going to prefix this entire demonstration with the fact that normally you're going to be doing your caching at a service layer. And so when I contemplated kind of walking through this, I was thinking about, okay, well, I could add a service and then DI that into the controller and then you know have those things abstracted away. But I thought it would just be easier to do... A demonstration inside the controller proper and we kind of get the, the sense of the mechanics so I'll do this in a I'll do this I'll take this approach this is not a production kind of approach that you'd want to take so we'll we'll explore in uh, maybe further depth an implementation using a service later on but for today for the, the simplicity and for the sake of talking about caching and how to add it to a project we're gonna start like this so I add a couple of packages I save out my project JSON NuGet goes off and restores it for me everything's happy I have what I need to get going the, the second thing that I need to do is I need to modify my startup, and I'm going into my configure services method, so I'll just control MO this guy down. Um, oh, uh, that's not what I meant to do. Let's try that again. Control MO, and that is not the keyboard shortcut that I am trying to get at, so... I'm excited but that it does anything. What does it normally do? Uh, could, usually it collapses everything to the definition of the sig at the signature oh. level for your methods, but what? I... Yeah, totally, right? So control MO, that, that, it's, it's a thing. It's a thing. And uh, it usually Magic. works. I'm not sure what's going on. I, I, think I, I did have Resharp, Resharp installed, and I've uninstalled it. I don't know if it left my key bindings all wacky or something. Regardless, I just wanted to get to the configure services piece um, really quickly. And you can see what I've done in after the call to add MVC is I've done a call to add caching. Now, um, I think the important thing here is that I'm doing that before I'm adding any other services. If you, the, What could happen is if um, just the way that you arrange things, if you try to add caching after you spin up a service that is going to start loading things into the cache, you just gotta need, need to be aware of how you configure the services that are available to your application. So just a kind of a side note, but as long as you add it early in your configure services, then you should be okay. Now, I have gone and created a caching controller, and this is a, a pretty straightforward thing. I'm DIing a couple of things in here, so um, I'll show you the two that I've brought in. The first one being on the an instance of memory cache, which is the iMemory cache, and that is made available to us through the configuration that we've done here with add caching. So this is an extension method that lives in those packages that we brought in and that's what makes that available to us. So DI is now configured and I can send this in. I've also added a logger because I want to demonstrate when we're actually hitting cache versus when we're having to actually create something. So I've added a couple of other things in here as well. So let me just rearrange those for clarity. Those are the two pieces that I'm pulling in via DI. I'm adding a key to access my cache, uh, the where I'm going to actually store the object that I'm saving, and I'm using a string message that I've got available here on my caching controller so that I can return that out. It's just, a, I could have made that local to my, um, my method. Uh, it, typically, you're going to have this set aside if you're inside of a service or something like that. Now, um, again, uh, the things like your keys that you're going to be using for caching, um, you, pr those are probably going to be have something that you set up inside of a constants uh, uh, class or something like that as well. Okay, so we just assigned these guys in. I've got an instance of the memory cache now. And it's pretty much, we can actually just do a get value, but then we're going to get a null back from our from the memory cache. So cache is just key value pairs. The key is um, a string and the value is an object. So we can stuff whatever we want in there. It doesn't have to be a string. In my case, I'm using a string, which I've actually defined up at the class level up there. Now, does that class have to be like 
serializable or yeah, there's anything prob- like that? Yeah, there's probably some conditions around that, but I, I mean, I tried with a POCO and that worked fine, so uh, there doesn't have to be any uh, annotations on it at all, that um, anything special to get it started. Right. Um, but I imagine if you're doing interesting things in your constructor or if you, you know, th- as it's getting um, revived from the cache, you probably want to make sure that they're it's not doing something that's re- that requires other services to be con- set, uh, configured. We can probably explore that a little bit later in, in another episode, in a follow-up as episode when we talk about distributed cache. Okay, so uh, when we set our cache, there's a number of overloads, but I, I wasn't actually able at this point to find a way to, to default in what our cache would be. So we, create an, we add a new instance of the memory cache entry options, and then we set an absolute expiration. So I'm going to expire the cache entry in five seconds. Now, I'm using this try get value, and the nice thing about it is that it returns a true, so we can evaluate whether or not that message actually was in the cache. If it was in the cache, then we simply pull it out from the cache, and that's what we rest- that's what we actually return. And we actually don't need to do the cache hit, so um, we just pull the um, the message that we have now. In this particular case, and it will we've, because we've got the out set, it's going to be setting it into our message variable. Right? If that if that's a false, we enter this if block, we add the new value in the cache, we set up our cache with our cache options, and we're just going to log appropriately. So these two log messages are going to be what we actually see. We're going to look at these cache expiration options in a couple of seconds, as long as, as well as some priority items. So I'm going to save this out, and we'll just go to our index here. Uh, another non-production thing, I, right before we return the view, I'm setting the cached message in the view bag again um, in a more uh, production ready approach you would actually just assign a value to a, uh, a view model that's going to be rendered on your page so here very simple straightforward page I have an h1 and a div the div contains a, a paragraph that has that outputs that cached message for us okay one final thing um, I wanted to be able to read, uh, this is kind of a crossover back to our logging episode. We did talk about setting different levels of logging and how you can actually configure that in your application so that you only see messages at certain framework levels for certain namespaces and things like that. So in this case, I wanted to demonstrate the logging um, I wanted to read this a little bit more easily. There's a lot of chatter that flies by the screen when we're logging um, output from our application. So um, I set the system namespace the Microsoft namespace to error and I set the default to verbose on our application log level so that way when I actually run the app we're going to be able to see only our logs unless there's something that goes fatally wrong in system or Microsoft okay so let's run this really quickly I'm gonna run it right here uh, from our project directory I've got my um, project.json so I can do uh, a DNX web and that is the default name of the exported task for our project that will actually start the web bits so let me pull up a browser here and when that starts to run we will go to localhost port 5000 so here's our application running and I will go to caching once this loads. And on our caching sample, we see 54. Okay, so this is going to expire before I get over here because it's five seconds. But let's have a look uh, really quickly. I'll slide this over. Date created. So that's the name of the key. It was generated and set in cache. When I hit this again, it, the cache would have rolled because it was five seconds, and we're going to see it. Um, be regenerated. So now it's at 16. I'm going to hit it again really quickly and it says that it was available and pulled from cache and I see that that's just off, off screen there for you. So that as soon as it lapses, as soon as that cache uh, expiry that we set lapses then it rolls over and it's going to have to create a new one. And that is pretty much all that is required to get cache working. So it's super exciting. Um, super simple uh, if not exciting now I'm gonna stop this uh, really quickly here and I want to show you guys a couple of other options that we've got so if I'm gonna head back to my caching controller really quickly I might want this guy 
I might want to set up some options here. So what are the kinds of things that can happen in cash that kind of cause us grief? Somebody's coming very often for the same kind of thing. We probably don't want it to expire as often. So maybe I'm going to do something like this. I'm going to say uh, from hours and I'm going to say absolutely no longer than one hour do I want to wait before I pull, I refresh my cash. So I'm going to expire it then. But we're going to set a sliding expiration from uh, time span dot from sec, or let's call it from minutes. And as long as somebody is calling this every five minutes, then it is actually going to stay in cash for us. Hmm. So this allows this sliding cache to keep going. It keeps resetting, but it's going to hit a maximum of one hour, and then it's going to flush out from our cache. Hmm. One go. of the other... Th Sorry, go ahead. I, I had a quick question for you about the memory cache here. Is What's the scope of that? Like we're using DI to inject that into our controller here. Does the controller get its own special memory cache, or is it a global memory cache? No, this will be... A Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, Simon. it's a glo it's a global one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, so, but it is it it is global, but it's local to this instance. So it'll be available from anyone who requests it um, inside of our processor. So any controller, any service that requests this, this cache will be available to it. Right. Okay. So those keys, we need to be pretty specific about them in general. If it's uh, something that was intended only for this controller. So you kind of have to worry about your keys overlapping if you're using something pretty generic for your key name. Exactly. Yeah, so when I do it, I tend to name it something like uh, controller colon action colon and then some specific key, which might be like the ID or something like that. Right. Uh, so and then the, the other thing to keep in mind is depending on how you implement your cache, uh, that you may implement your cache in a way such that it bypasses security checks. So it could be possible that if somebody right. hits a cache item and caches it, then it's possible to get it out from somebody else uh, to, to get that information and see it. And then, of course, there's a whole world of like possible timing attacks by caching stuff, but I don't want to get into that. Right. <laughs> and there's one other, one other thing that I want to mention as well is that when cache is subjected to high load, it tends to turn over more frequently. And so this policy that we've got right now, we might want to actually enhance it a little bit and say, um, look, I, I, don't, I don't care about your load, so we're going to set the priority of it. And I can say, do you know um, my cache item priority? I get, so I get a... a just a, an enum that I can work with and I can say you know this is a higher priority so I want it to stay in longer than other things when you're under load or this is lower and I don't care about it as much you can let it go if I'm under load and then there's obviously normal which is the default but then there's also never remove so this means that this item will stay in cache as long as somebody's hitting it every five minutes but no longer than one hour so we've got some pretty good options for setting up uh, cache expiration right out of the box. Cool. Yeah, this so, in syntax is much nicer than the old way of doing it, too. Yes, Total. and I, I do want to, again, just point out that this is for a local single-server cache. This will not help in a distributed environment where you would need to have that across multiple instances of your app under a load balance scenario, things like that. Yeah, we should do a whole episode on that. That would be interesting yeah, to talk about. A whole other topic. Absolutely. So... If you guys remember the the cache tag helper that I did in in one of the episodes, uh, that's using this iMemory cache underneath it, and you'll probably notice uh, there's a lot of overlap there in terms of the sliding and absolute expiry mm -hmm. and setting right. priorities and that kind of thing. It, the cache tag helper also exposes a lot of the same. Excellent. Do you know, when I when we put this video together, we'll make sure that we've got all the links to configuration, to logging, and to the uh, tash or the cache tag helper. We'll put those all in the links for the video. Yep. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, thanks a lot, James. That was enlightening as always. And thank you, everybody, for coming out and watching this episode of the ASP Net Monsters. And we'll see you all next episode. Cheers. See ya. Thank you. Bye.